All right. All right. So, as I mentioned, I, I teach entrepreneurship. So, I teach this as part of my class. But I'm not here to teach you the academic merits of Business Model Canvas. I'm here to teach you how I have used this in my own personal practice in helping active CEOs figure out new business, extension businesses, and sometimes even their own business. So it's going to be more of a practical case of how to use a business model canvas. I mean, let's face it, once we get into it, if you don't already know what a business model canvas looks like, it's nine blocks, blah, blah, blah. You're going to need a lot of sugar if that's what I'm spending my time on. I'm going to talk to you about how to use this tool and how to use it properly. So the first thing that I'll tell you is I've worked for big companies and I've worked for startups, and big companies tend to treat business model canvas as a checkbox. Does anybody here have any affiliation to, CM, to uh, UPMC? So I did a stint at UPMC as an entrepreneur in residence, and I would ask them, did you do a business model canvas? And they would say, yeah, we did it. And they'd pull it out. And they'd say, here it is. And that's useless. That's a waste of time. If you fill out a business model canvas once, you might as well look at it as a checklist, and you can go look at all the different things in the business model canvas. That's not what this tool is about. So let's, let's talk about the tool. Now, by the way, how many of you come from a technical background? Raise your hand. At least two thirds. I'm, my undergrad's in mechanical engineering too. So I know how you think. And most engineers think it's all about the product. You probably even have professors that tell you that. Right? It's all about the product. Why waste your time with the business plan? Well, I'm here going to show you why the business plan is really important. I'm not saying the product's not important, but the business plan is, is probably more important. So we're going to go through a couple different models just to kind of get you thinking about all the different variations you can think about when you are looking at a business model. So has anybody ever heard of the long tail model? You're shaking your head yes. Have you, have you heard of it? Yes. What is it? Uh, I mean, it's kind of what it looks like, right? You've got a few things which are perform better or have more quantity or whatever, and then by focusing on the the higher number, the, the greater diversity of things which don't aren't uh, as numerous uh, or as popular. Kind of yeah, so I'm gonna have something I'm there. gonna highlight a couple words you use because you, you're on the right track. Uh, I mean, you said. Um, Lower, lower quantities, more specialization. You didn't use the word niche, but a niche, the word niche usually comes out. Um, fundamentally, as the web became you know, so predominant in our society and lowered the variable cost of delivering a product, it really enabled this, this kind of a business model, right? So back in the old days, when I was some of your ages, if I wanted to go watch a movie, I'd go to Blockbuster. Anybody remember Blockbusters? Some of you might remember Blockbusters, right? And you'd walk into a Blockbuster video store and all the walls would be full of VHS tapes and um, you'd see a, a shelf right here when you walk in that says there's the new releases, the popular ones, right? Um, and maybe you wanted to see a new release, but maybe you had a special, you wanted to see a documentary on, uh, um, who knows, whatever and you have particular interests. And you're not likely to find niche kind of products in a Blockbuster, uh, depending upon how niche it is, why? Because there's only so much room on the shelves, right? That's true in Walmart, that's true in CVS, that's true in any regular brick and mortar uh, retail outlet. But with technology, you can start to do things like Netflix did, right? So Netflix started out with no technology at all, saying we're gonna just deliver you a, um, a DVD in the mail, um, and then they got the streaming working properly, and now they can deliver a specialized movie, documentary, piece of content at an extremely low variable cost, right? So you can deliver product that is very specific to a small niche group, and by the way, charge a whole lot more for it. Frankly, I don't have it on my slide here. I think the even better example of it is Amazon. If I want to write a book on Business Model Canvas, I can write a book on Business Model Canvas, and if you guys are the only ones that, that buy it, 
you would be able to buy it from Amazon because they would print it as it was ordered, right? That is a long tail model. So you're no longer constrained by having to create a product that only the masses want, right? Which is what everything used to be constrained by. That's the long tail model. Um, another point is, and this is really important when we get to the business model canvas, is most businesses have more than one customer. They can, have, they can have more than one customer if they have different segments within a, a customer group, or they can have synergistic customers that complement each other or enable each other. And one cannot exist without the other. And usually one is a paying customer and one is not, although sometimes they can both be. So, reCAPTCHA. Who knows what reCAPTCHA does? Who's familiar with reCAPTCHA? What's reCAPTCHA do? It puts up something uh, that uh, it comes from, uh, I don't know, like some text maybe that the computer can't read. And it has you read it and then put it to prove that you're human. So it proves you're not a robot. Yeah. By the way, where did recapture come from? Duolingo, or the guy. Luis Anand, yeah. who was a member of the faculty, I think technically still is, at Carnegie Mellon. It's a Carnegie Mellon spin out, it was before he did Duolingo. Yeah. Um, who pays for it? Do you pay for it to prove you're not a robot? Does the, the e commerce site pay for it? No. So who pays for it? What's their revenue stream? So aren't they selling the tags for the text? So if you're, for instance, writing this word down, you're actually transcribing old uh, uh, copies of, for instance, the New York Times from who knows how long ago, right? And digitizing it. And the New York Times is paying for that service. A third party that has nothing to do with these specific interactions that you have going on right now. So in this case, you actually have three customers. You have the e-commerce site, you have the consumer, and you have the New York Times. They're also now, of course, digitizing um, pictures for AI as well. That's what the stoplights are for, and is there a car, and that sort of thing. So when you're thinking about business models, you have to be creative. There's a lot of room for creativity, not just in the products, in the business model, of how do you pay for something, and, and who are you creating value for, right? And this tool will help you do that. I think, uh, come on, come on. Yep. There's also, of course, network um, effects where you have organizations that only create value if you've got a lot of people using it. So all these guys are examples of that. YouTube, Facebook, Alibaba. Alibaba would be more of the B2B example. Um, you can have many, many customers, and some of them will be paying and some of them will not. And then sometimes, you start out with a free product, right? But nothing's free forever. You have to extract revenue and value somewhere, right? So, you know, back in the day, I don't use Pandora anymore, but I used to use Pandora. And if you were willing to, to deal with the commercials, you didn't have to pay for it. So I'm old, so I did. But my kids would say, you're crazy about <coughs> listening to these commercials. Um, LinkedIn, how many have a professional profile on LinkedIn? Wow! Now, I don't mean just a LinkedIn profile. I mean a paid oh. premium profile. Okay, now the number changes to one. How much are you paying for it? You know, I, I frankly don't remember. I set it up probably six or eight months ago and it just automatically comes out. And, uh, well, that, that's the beauty of a subscription yeah, model. That's why they, they love it. So I don't know what it is now, and I think they have different tiers. I don't have my premium copy anymore, but I did when I used it to sell, and when I was doing it, it was 65 bucks a month. Yeah, it's, Every it's month. lower than that. I have the lowest tier, whatever the yeah. lowest tier one was. But yeah, that's the hook that right. once you get in, it takes an effort on your part to get out. That's right. And that's right. they're banking on the fact that you won't get out. So everybody raised their hand. They had a LinkedIn profile, but... One, only one person is actually paying that premium, but you're paying a nice premium for that. Yeah, it, yeah. It's not cheap, right? So, and you're doing that because you're using it as a sales tool or, you know, that's what I was using it for anyway. Um, so, you know, layering services on top of a free service, service that brings people into the system and, and into the product and into the ecosystem, and that enables value to be derived so that it can be a good sales tool that I'm willing to pay $65 for is, is a freemium model. So there's a lot of different approaches and they're not all technology, right? So what's, 
What's cool and unique about uh, IKEA? What makes IKEA kind of a neat business model? You build it? Well, that's what you do as a consumer. Have you ever built one, by the way? Many times. Yeah, so, I, so have I. I built like a dresser for my house up in the mountains, and it took me all day long to build the thing. They're not easy to build, are they? But when they're done, they're actually a pretty nice piece of furniture, right? Yeah. The beauty of it is, you were free labor, so was I. In fact, we paid to be labor, <laughs> right? Um, and nobody else had ever done that. And all the efficiencies that go with that, so that you can package it in very small packaging, and your shipping, your, log your logistics, your inventory, holding costs, everything go way down. And yet, it can be a nice quality piece of furniture if you're willing to spend a day putting it together, right? That's what was unique about IKEA. So it doesn't have to be technology. There's a lot of room for innovation in business models. So this guy right here is Don Jones. You might recognize him from over there, the Don Jones Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. <coughs> Don was my professor when I was a student here back in the Stone Ages of the mid-90s. Um, great friend, he's since passed away. Um, Don used to give me all kinds of advice, but one of the pieces of advice that I've never forgot is, and he called me Bill, not Will, he said, Bill, stop making things complicated. Great businesses are simple. Keep it simple in everything that you do. If it's too complicated, then you need to go back and revisit it, right? So I, I suggest that when you look at this tool as well. So finally we're getting to the business model canvas. Here it is. You can drown, download this right off the internet. It has nine boxes. I'm going to take you through all nine, but I'm not going to spend equal time on all nine. So the first thing I want to do is kind of give you the lay of the land. Not all is equal on this canvas. The first thing is, if you really look at this, whoa, that was crazy. OK, hold on. Like all my secrets. In fact, we'll just go one more so I don't have to deal with it. So if you look at this, everything on the right <coughs> that's colored in green is externally focused. It's focused on who's my customers? What do they look like? How many of them are there? What are their qualifying characteristics? How tightly can I segment those customers? By the way, extremely important. If you don't segment your customer groups properly and break them down into the distinct groups that make them unique, when you go out and do customer discovery, you're very likely to just get uh, data that looks by, like white noise. If you ever go do customer discovery and your data is all over the map, it's because you haven't segmented your customers properly and deep enough. Because if you do that, you're going to get distinct res responses that are meaningful to you. So customers, value proposition, what they pay you, how they find out about you, what they expect from you. It's all externally focused. It's all about the customer, which, by the way, as an entrepreneur, that you, is what you should be spending 99% of your time on. Externally focused. Don't get stuck and sucked into the internal crap. On the left side is the internal crap, right? It's all about execution. I'm not saying execution is unimportant. It's important. But if you don't get the right side correct, the left side doesn't matter. So everything on the left side is about how do I deliver this product? What partners do I need? What resources? What do I need to be good at? What's it going to cost, right? So external. Internal. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through how to use this tool and what you're going to find is I don't go left to right, I don't go right to left. There's a very specific order that I use when I use this tool and that order is actually really important. If you skip the order, you're not going to get as much out of this. So the first thing you do, as with anything you should probably already know from the little I've said, is you start with the customer. Right? So if you download this document, all these little words here, I just made them big here because I'm old now and can't see any big letters, right? So this is just the same thing that's in that box. But you start with the customer. Now, I already said most businesses have more than one customer. And if you only have one customer, I guarantee you have more than one segment, right? You need to go deep on the customers and you need to understand, again, what makes them unique? What qualifies them as your customer? How many of them are there? What different groups exist within them? 
and really challenge whether you've got them all. If we have time at the end of this, I like to have a guinea pig come up and we'll try to do the customers together as a group. And you always find that you have more than you think you do. So you can come up and try to prove me wrong. Now, one thing that I, I really, really stress, when you're detailing your customers, detail is really important. It's too easy to go, well, my customers are people who like donuts. By the way, yeah. we had some good questions. I've got to start passing these out. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to eat them. Oh, I'm not eating them. <laughs> hey, you answered a bunch of questions, so you get a donut. All right. You feel free to give it away if you don't want. Um, Detail is really important. Without that detail, you don't get the value, okay? Now, once you've detailed your customers, then you jump all the way over here to value proposition. Why? Because I want you to define the value that you are hypothesizing for every customer in every customer segment. So if you have three customers, and each customer is broken into two segments, you better have six value propositions on here. And I want you to be as quantifiable as possible, right? Wherever possible, express value proposition in number. So, you know, really value only comes in a few different ways when you really break it down. You either make somebody money or save them money. So money is one, time is one, although I could argue that time is money anyway, right? Or you create a relationship that provides its own intrinsic value, right? It really comes down to those three things, right? So quantify that wherever possible. Even when you talk about relationships, there's a value associated with that. Um, and, you know, here's some examples and questions that can be asked. This is a tool to help you think through that. But I want you to really challenge yourself and try to figure out what the value is for each of the customers, whether they're going to pay you for the product or not. But, because I was a student of Don Jones, and he relentlessly told me to keep things simple, um, I, I like to simplify it as well. So the bottom line is these three steps. Define the value proposition for each customer, quantify it, and it has to be rel relative to the competing alternatives, right? So, it is not acceptable when you're using this tool to say, I don't have competition. I don't care what idea you come up with, you always have competition. Even if the competition is doing the same crap that you've always been doing or not doing anything at all, that's a competitive alternative, right? It has to be relative to what the competition is. And you have to consider this factor called a goodness factor. So has anybody heard this term yet, goodness factor? Goodness factor is actually a term that, uh, that was developed by Don Jones as well. So it's unique to Carnegie Mellon. Essentially what the goodness factor says is that if you create a product, it needs to be significantly better than their alternative or they're not going to buy it. Because you have to overcome the intrinsic switching costs. And people are lazy. So if I create a product that's worth $100, if, I'm, if this donut's worth $100 to you, and I'm charging you $100, will you buy it from me? It's worth 100 bucks. Not really. Not really, you're not very excited about it. <laughs> Why? I gain nothing. You gain nothing, right. If I, if I said that donut was worth $100 though and I was gonna charge you $10, would you buy it from me? Sure. Yeah, so and in that case, the goodness factor is 10, right? So you need to think about that and quantify that and think about what what is the goodness factor of my product and how large is it? The Don used to say it has to be at least three. I would say in today's day and age, it needs to be somewhere between three and 10. So the company that I started and ended up selling to Philips um, was in the home healthcare space. We increased revenue fivefold. So my goodness factor was, was 5X, right? I was in the middle of that, in the middle of that range. You need to be somewhere in that range, right? The higher you are, the better. So detail, again, is important. Now, the next step I go to is revenue. So customer, value, now revenue. Kind of an interesting jump. Let's talk about revenue for a minute. What is revenue? To you all, what is revenue? Whoever answers gets to do it. 
Nobody wants a donut. <laughs> <laughs> you can give it what? No, uh, okay, what's revenue? Do I get a donut? Uh, yes, you get a donut. Awesome. Money coming into the business. If you get it right. Money coming into the business. Correct, but that is true, but not the question, not the answer I'm looking for. You can still have a donut. Come on up. I got to get rid of this. <laughs> so he said the money coming in, that somebody pays you for your product. He's right. But I want to go a level above. So try to go a level above. What, what is revenue above and beyond the money somebody pays you? Wait, you didn't come. You left. What else is it? value that it's generating into the business. Wow, you're really close. So she said it's the value that's generated into the business from the customer. Right? Am I? That's right, yeah. Yeah. So all the transactions. You're 99.9% .9 of the way there. You get a donut for that one. Um, the uh, where where the net? Um, at, at its highest level, revenue is how your customer rewards you for the value you provide. Right? They're they're telling you what it's worth. I mean, bottom line, if they don't pay you, then it's not worth anything. Right? They're not valuing. Right? So revenue is how your customer tells you that you're providing value. So that's why it's the next step, right? So how do we, how do we look at revenue? Well, I like to do everything on the back of a napkin. I'm on my fourth startup now. Every startup I've ever done has started with some simple calculations on the back of a napkin. If you don't understand the basic fundamentals of the economics of a business, you can't start a business, right? So that's why I like to use the back of the napkin. So we're going to use my example with the donut that's worth 100 bucks. If my donut's worth $100 to the customer and I want to achieve a goodness factor of 10, right, then the simple math is I, I can expect to extract $10 of value for that product, right? That's my revenue. Now, I also, if I know the number of customers from the customer part of the, uh, the model, I can tell you how big the opportunity is. And part of what this business model canvas is here for is to help you figure out as quickly as possible whether this is a business worth you spending your time. Because your time is the most viable thing you will ever have in your life, period, end of story, right? So if it is not a big enough opportunity, then you should go work on some other some other business idea, right? So now I have an estimate based on goodness factor, based upon the value, and based upon uh, the number of customers. So let me ask you this at this point. Do you think that every one of these parameters, and this is just a pretty simple calculation, right? Do you think that there's any risk that I might be wrong about any of those? Sure. You say yes? yes. You both say yes? Yeah. You both Anybody who said yes can come out and get a donut. I'm trying to give these donuts away, right? I would never eat a cheap donut. Uh, you never eat a cheap donut? No. Oh, well then I'll pay. I'll charge you hundred bucks for it. Do you want it now? It beats my hundred dollar donut standards. <laughs> They're quite high. I think I got ripped off on these donuts. Anyway, there's all kinds of things that could be wrong, on, right? There, there's probably just to get to this stupid back of the napkin calculation. I've made an estimate of what the, what the niche looks like, how I define the customer niche, how many of them there specifically are, um, what the value is that I believe, I hypothesize my product can deliver, um, whether 10x is a good enough switching factor to overcome the switching costs from my competitors. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of uh, variables there. And by the way, I don't even know how I'm going to get this 10 bucks yet, right? It's 10 bucks. I think I can get 10 bucks. I haven't figured out yet whether I can get that in a subscription fee or a one-time cost, or maybe it's a dynamic pricing model. There's a lot of different options there, and I don't know any of them yet. The point in me bringing this up is that's one of the most important parts of this, right, is the, going through this exercise forces you to come to terms with what you know and what you don't know, right? And you can't be afraid of what you don't know. As a matter of fact, you should be attracted to what you don't know because that's where you should be spending your time. That's how you reduce and manage your risk, right? 
So when we get to the, the actual use of the canvas, what you're going to find is what I typically recommend is you get a big copy of this canvas, kind of like on this board here, and I use 3M stickies. And I have green ones, and I have yellow ones, and I have red ones. And if it's a high risk, it goes on red. If I know that this is a proven fact that goes in green, and if there's some assumption or hypothesis associated with it, it goes on yellow. And the reason I do that is because when I am done, it will be obvious both to me and to everybody on my team where the risks are and where we need to focus on. Right? It's there. It's a collaborative tool. And by the way, if we mitigate that risk, it takes me about 30 seconds to take down that sticky and put a, a green one up. Right? It should evolve. It's not a one-time thing. That's what bugged me about the UPMC experience, right? Was they, they did it once and they said they did it. But, you know, that's just not very valuable. This is supposed to be a collaborative tool that helps the team communicate, right? So here's, what I, here's where I might throw you a little bit of a, of a left curve is we're talking about revenue now. And I just told you that I'm a stickler for detail on customers and value. And what I'm going to tell you here is don't get hung up on the details. So if I go back one here, here's all the different versions of pricing that they put in here as things to think about. You know, you could sell it as an asset, you could charge a usage fee, you could charge a subscription, you could lease it, um, you know, you could get it through advertising, it could be fixed pricing, it could be dynamic pricing. There's a lot, and there's, that doesn't cover all of it, right? There's a lot of different options on the pricing, and I'm going to tell you, don't worry about it. Because right now, what's important is what's my share of the value that I can expect to extract. And the reason I say that is early on when you're, when you're just beginning your business, if you spend a lot of time, and I've seen a lot of startup and first-time entrepreneurs do this, they will spend a lot of time trying to figure out their pricing. And they are almost always wrong. I was wrong in every startup I ever did in what I first thought the pricing would be. Worry more about are, is there enough money here in terms of value and enough money left over for you to build a real, sustainable, viable business. Worry about how you price it later on because you're going to find that what you think is true is not true anyway. So don't worry about picking one of these. Just know that they're, they're all possibilities for you. So now with that, I want to do a time check. We've now talked about three of these boxes, and it's already 1 o'clock. I'm, believe it or not, right on schedule. I spent a half an hour on the first three boxes. So what do we know from just these first three boxes? Well, first of all, hopefully we understand the customer in a lot of detail. We also understand how the customer, each one of those customers, benefits from the product or service that we're trying to create. Lastly, lastly, we understand, is the opportunity big enough for our time? Just the first three boxes. So that's a lot, right? Would you agree? That's pretty, those are three pretty important things. But there's one other thing that may be as important as all the other three put together. So does anybody have a guess what it would be? It's less obvious than the first three. But I actually have talked about it already. How much is it going to cost you? Well, we haven't even gotten the cost yet. Yeah, we're, we're all just on the customer side yet. Okay. Uh, we will get there, though. What, what else do we know just from these three boxes? What are our competitors also doing? So we do know a little bit about the competitive environment and how we relate to that, right, with the goodness factor. But that's not what I'm thinking of. So how they're going to pay you? We actually probably don't know how they're going to pay us, but we know what, what we think we can extract. Right? So we probably don't know that yet. <clears throat> Do you understand or your team how to actually deliver the solution? No, don't, don't know that yet either, because that's on the execution side. One more try. A go or no go on the idea? Uh, you probably have some of that from this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what it is. By the way, I've only, so I've, I've presented this this way in my classes and then connects a lot of times. I've only had someone get this right once. Um, the important thing that you also know is what you don't know. <laughs> but it's not a I mean, it's, 
really important to be honest with yourself are where are the risks? Where are the hypotheses that you need to now bring the risk out of? Right? Because that's where you should be focusing your time. It is human nature, I know this from experience, it's human nature to focus on the things that you feel comfortable with. You know, I know these customers, so I'm going to go spend time with these customers. When you never actually figured out whether the value proposition is real, right? you have to use this as a tool to make the risks really obvious to the whole team. Right? That part of it is, I can't overemphasize how important that part is. So, who's this guy? You're smiling, do you know who it is? Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, yeah, so you know where he's from? Pittsburgh. He's from Pittsburgh, yeah. And what's this movie here? Jurassic Park. It's Jurassic Park, one of my favorite <laughs> movies, right? And I actually have a favorite quote from this movie, right? It gets to, I think, your comment about whoever said uh, you know whether you want to go forward with this or not. Um, my favorite quote of his is when he asked, they asked his opinion. He said, you know, the problem I have with this is your scientists are so preoccupied with whether they could do it, but they never stop to think about whether they should. Part of what you're answering here is, you, you know, and especially all of you who raised your hands at your technical background, you're going to want to focus on can you do it, you know. But there's a more important question is should you do it? Not because you're going to create dinosaurs that end the world, but because, um, you may waste a bunch of your time, right? You need to think through, is this the right opportunity for me to go after? And am I thinking about it the right way? So, all of that is with the first three boxes. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of zoom through the other six. Not because they're not important, but because if you don't get those first three right, the rest of this is just a waste of time and busy work, don't waste your time. Right? You have to get the first three right. I will spend a little more time on these next two boxes, primarily because they often get confused. So the next box I usually go to is customer relationships. So customer relationships is, what will your customer expect from you? In their buying decision process, in whatever deployment process there is, and in their use of your product from now till forever, what do they expect? Do you need to have a customer service team? Is this all self-serve and completely handled by technology? Do you need to have account managers? So I'll give you a real world example. When I started my company MedSage that I sold to Philips, um, it was a SaaS product that did uh, replenishment follow-up to patients in home health care. It was all technology and automated and it generated a lot of great revenue. But what we found very quickly was that over eh, the first three or four months that we would go live with a customer, they'd get fantastic results and then they'd start to uh, plateau and maybe even go down a little bit. And we went and really investigated in that and what we found was they had turnover with their employees, they had new people come in, start using our software, they didn't tell us, they just gave them their password, right? We had no idea it was happening. They weren't using it right they weren't leveraging the power of the tool, and by the way, we could actually uh, expose problems in their process. So we had to create an account manager who would meet with those customers once a month, once a quarter, not once a month, once a quarter, and give them a pretty detailed report. And with that detailed report, we could tell them everything they ever wanted to know about their business. I knew whether it was a well-run home care company before the CEO did because the data in our software. I had no idea we were going to need that. No idea. And I was lucky that our margins were high enough that we could support that. And over time we figured out how to do that more scalable. But it's better to think about that up front and think about what kind of support you need. That's what customer relationships is all about. That's why it's important. The other box that everybody seems to get confused with that is channels. So channels is distinctly different, right? Customer relationships, what your customer expect from you. Channels is how do they find out? How do they even know you exist, right? How do they figure out if, if it really helps them? How do they buy it? How do you deliver it, right? Those are the kinds of, and there's a little bit of overlap with after sales, but fundamentally, it's all about how does the customer get the product? So channels are distinctly different from relationships. Don't get those two confused. Both very important. After you've got the first three 
Uh, segments completed. All right, now I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Some of them are pretty self-obvious, right? And you can use the, the questions here, but every business has a set of activities that you have to be good at. <clears throat> what are those? Right? What resources do you need? That's what the resources part is to support them. You know, if you're in a distribution business, you may need a warehouse. If you're in a software business, you're going to need some software coders. You might need uh, a server. Um, you may need a QA engineer. Um, some of them may be intellectual, some of them may be human, some of them may be physical assets. But you need to think through what are the key activities that we need to be exceptionally good at and what are the resources we need to support those. And by the way, you don't have to do it all yourself. Some of it could be through partners. So the startup that I'm working on now um, is actually kind of a distribution business, but I have a partner who does all the distribution for me, so I don't ever actually need to take ownership of any inventory, which is a huge advantage to the model that I'm pursuing. Right? But you need to think about what those partners are. Um, and all of that leads to cost. Right? So finally, we are to cost. It's the last thing on the list. And it's important because if you can't make money, if it's not scalable, then again, you're wasting your time, right? But you have to go through all those things before you get to that. And again, in the beginning, it can be a back of the napkin kind of a calculation, right? Now you start a revenue. You're not starting a value, you're starting a revenue. So you're, you think you can extract $10 and your direct cost is $3. So some of you probably know very specifically what direct cost means and some of you may not. So. Who's familiar with direct costs so we can explain it to anybody who might not be? I know you are. <laughs> direct, yeah. Go ahead. Direct costs, like if you're making donuts, the direct cost is the people that are you know, baking the stuff, the flour, whatever ingredients you're buying, all that's direct. That's direct, because that's, that's the stuff that is required, the expenses that's required to make that donut. Right? Maybe even the gas that's used to heat the stove, right? But right. Is the stove direct cost or the store? No, because they're they're indirect costs. They they go to support a lot of things. Besides making donuts, maybe you're also I don't know. Right. Doing so, something else. So and they they tend to be more fixed, right? I actually know the guy that owns all the Dunkin' Donuts stores. So he his salary is not direct cost. He's right. overhead, right? Yeah. Or his account. Or as a cow. Those. Right, right. So direct cost is the variable cost that's intrinsic to every unit of whatever product and every value that you give, right? So you know, if you're getting 10 bucks and it costs you three, then you have seven bucks left. And if you have 10 million customers, which is what my example was, potential customers, then you've got the potential of $70 million to cover your indirect costs and your fixed costs. Right? You, that number has to be high enough that you uh, have enough buffer to be able to support that. And by the way, you have to keep in mind too that you're not going to start out on day one generating $70 million of profit, of gross profit. Right? This, is, this is a gross number that, that just gives you an idea of where you are. Right? But then you have to figure out, well, what are the fixed costs? Is this going to be incredibly expensive? You know, think about the fixed cost of, whoops, let me go back. Think about the fixed cost back in the, the 1800s when this country built railroads, right? They had to make those tracks last forever to overcome the fixed cost. Chances are we're not going to build a railroad. I'm using an absurd example, right? But you have to figure out an opportunity that generates enough profit potential with a low enough fixed cost to make it something that you can actually raise money for, right? So, how are we doing time-wise now? We've gone through all of them. We have 15 minutes left. What have we learned? Well, um, first thing is, back in the day when I was Dawn's student, we would go through and we'd do a bunch of analysis and we'd write this big, thick business plan. Like the business plans I wrote for the business I developed in, in my class when I was a student here was probably this thick, at least a half an inch thick. And by the way, all those assumptions that I made, 
some pretty significant percentage of them were wrong, and then you had to rewrite the thing. Um, that became your business plan that you went out and raised money on. Um, it also became the fundamental premise of your internal business plan along with the financial model that you build, which you did a, a connects on what, earlier this week or last week? Right? Yeah. Um, in this case, the business model canvas becomes really the cornerstone along with the financial model of your internal business plan. You don't have to do a fancy write-up. You keep this accurate, detailed, and evolve it as you mitigate those risks. And it becomes something that anybody who's a member of your team can walk in and very quickly see where the business is, where the risks are, and what the revenue generation possibility is and what the profit possibility is. Um, it also, by the way, is something that an investor who may be looking to invest in you when they're in due diligence will probably come in and take a look at. I certainly like to look at those when I'm looking at that. It is not, though. It is not part of your pitch. That's, your pitch is your external business plan. And this is your backup to it, right? So it's the cornerstone of all your internal business planning. Um, it has to be as specific as possible. Um, start with customers and value proposition. Follow the order that I presented pretty strictly, quite frankly. Um, use it as a way to prioritize what you don't know in your risks um, and make it an evolving tool. It should be a collaborative tool, right? And if you use it that way, um, it can be really uh, effective way of managing your team um, and what you're focusing on in any given one time within the start. Questions, comments? What if? Go ahead, I saw this one, then I'll go to you. Yeah. So the, the difference in the order you presented it and the layout on the screen, does that reflect like your preference and what is important or an industry-wide preference? Because normally you would do things in some priority and it would visually match that priority so you know how to read it. <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about the history of this tool. So this tool, and many of the tools that are, are, have now become kind of enshrined under the, the envelope we call lean entrepreneurship come from other areas. So one of the things we use a lot is the uh, customer empathy map to really define the qualification criteria for the customer. That comes from the design uh, profession, right? The business model canvas uh, was developed by a group over in Stanford. Um, and they developed kind of a framework about what lean entrepreneurship is and how it should be performed. Um, and they, they may or may not present it the way I do. I present it this way because I've used it this way. Like I've used this with many CEOs and startup founders. This to me is what I see as the most effective way to do it. So I really don't care how they present it. <laughs> I present it the way I think is the most effective. That you're asking, should we reorganize the boxes? I don't know. Well, right, because there's. It works there's just as well. You do, but someone else has to read it. So when an investor comes in, mm. how do they read it? And is it, is this, do they read it the way you, the way you put it? Or, um, like they've never in the end, box. that's a good question. So in the end, none of these boxes are unimportant, right? None of these categories are unimportant. But as you're developing it, how you develop them, and in what order, I think is very important, right? So I don't really care which way an investor looks at it. In fact, myself, when I look at it, I actually don't come in and go, okay, I gotta look at customers first. Now I gotta look at value. I don't follow that. You know what I do? I look at where the, where the risk points are. Oh, this one's red? I'm gonna look at that, right? I'm gonna look at the high risk points first as an investor or maybe someone who's looking on, you know, potentially joining the company. So over time, they become where you focus. And hopefully, you know, you, you mitigate them and turn them yellow and eventually green. And they will as the company evolves. Does that answer your question? So you have a question. similar question. Oh, same question? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Other questions?
Yes. What, what if we follow this order and at the end we come up to the cost structure and see that the cost is very high? Uh, okay, so his question is what if you follow this order and the, in the end the cost is really high? Well, you've got a problem, right? That's exactly what this tool is designed to help you do, right? So now, you know, it, if you want to put it on the board, you can. That's going to be a bright red area. That's a risk. So you, you're going to have to go back now and challenge your assumptions and say, can I do something to increase the scalability, to lower the variable cost, maybe to do it without so much capital investment required? Or maybe my value is, is off. I need to figure out a way to make this more valuable so that I can extract more value from my customers. Right? Wouldn't you rather know that now before you went and built the product up? Yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure. Yeah. So it all has to it all has to tie together in the end. Yes. Other questions? Anybody want to be a guinea pig? Come on up. You get a donut. Are you already did you get a donut before? I didn't, but I'm all right. <laughs> We're giving away donuts if you like donuts. All right. Uh, what is your give us the elevator pitch for your business? So my company is called Connect Wolf. We make a connected accessory for babies, a wearable um, that can pop into some fashionable accessories. And it has GPS and a cellular connection, the heart rate monitor. So basically, if I want to, from home, check on my kid, I peek in the nursery and see that they're where they should be and still breathing. But now, while the kid's at grandma's or daycare, and I'm at work or on a date with my husband, I can do the same thing. Very cool. So uh, before we get into the guinea pig part, um, I have a really good friend. In fact, I'm an investor in his company called Circadians. Have you ever heard of Circadians? Yeah, David Grohl. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've talked to David. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. He's great. Because he's, he'd be the first person I'd introduce. <laughs> yeah. Circadians makes a product that monitors infants for SIDS, if you remember what SIDS is. Actually, nobody really knows what causes SIDS, but essentially you monitor them and go shake them if they, uh, if they stop Breathing. Super high risk kids. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, who, so what's it called again? The company's connectable. The products Precious Connect. <coughs> All right. Who are the customers? First time moms in their second trimester of their first pregnancy. Wow. Very, very specific. So, first time. Second uh, trimester. Mm -hmm. Uh, why that? Why second trimester? So the baby isn't born yet. Baby isn't born yet. Okay. So most of these products, uh, high-end baby tech products, are purchased not actually by the mother. The mother's the decision maker, but it are are put onto her um, baby registry and are purchased by somebody for her shower. We also have a little bump uh, about a week or two after the baby's born, where people are like kind of rejiggering what they thought parenthood was going to be and need. And then another, like another medium one, right before she goes back to work, usually around ten or eleven weeks. Okay, but so, that's so, our yeah. So working moms is another. One. And then maybe there's a third, which is uh, I'll just call it new moms. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yeah. So that's our first customer, um, but we have kind of like the new mommy dashboard, right? And so smart home companies have started investing in some of the other baby tech product spaces because one of the uh, key times that people change their uh, habit patterns is in that first year of that baby's life. So it's like an ecosystem entry point. So eventually we look for integrations uh, with those sorts of things. That's not, that's not MVP, right? MVP right, is. Right. So this is smart home companies. Yeah. So you can integrate with smart home providers, we'll call it. Yep. And, okay. then, and then one more, um, which is super broad, and I don't have much dialed down into it, uh, but we, one of the requests that we get in our interviews is like a curated list of baby products. Um, so we could have um, kind of like a group on, like a once a week high-end um, product that, and not necessarily baby product, but the new moms are looking for. Um, I think the, the one that gets re like requested the most is like, could you tell me which is the best uh, air purifier? Because I can't tell the difference. So like things that new moms buy. So I'm gonna call that specialty retailers. They could be digital, they could be brick and mortar. Exactly. So uh, any others? 
That's a good list, by the way. Any, any others that you guys can think of that we may have forgotten? I say we as if I did it because I didn't. Go ahead. This would maybe not be a pain one, but pediatricians would recommend or That's prescribe. That's good. Yeah. Potentially? That's kind of the same as a NICU. NICU? Yeah, the NICU. Uh, yeah, newborn ICU. So, like. No, I know what a NICU are, is. Oh, so, you're, yeah. you're saying use it in the hospital? Yes. Like, so hospital. So, that goes with doctors, I think. Yes. Not MVP, but my background's actually in medical devices, and, and we're building everything so that we can put it through the FDA. It could be. Could be, yeah. 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 Head collars? Yes. Pet yep. collars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so our new moms actually tend to be responsible for like three populations that can't call them when they need help. They are responsible for babies under four, because four-year-olds have actually phone watches. Um, they are responsible for pets, dogs and cats, that they would like to put this on. They even like, even some are willing to pay full price for um, one that wouldn't be reading heart rate, it would just go on the dog collar. And um, eld uh, elderly parents, aging parents with like dementia or something. Okay, so elderly parents is not allowed. Mm -hmm. And they can have them all on one dashboard and make their lives easier to surplus. So there's at least one more that I thought of that nobody's brought up yet. Disabled care? What's that? Disabled care? Mm hmm. And not, not just elderly, but even young people that are disabled. That's true. Okay. So the one I was thinking of was, um, you, you said at the beginning, when you were talking about this, mm -hmm. that you envisioned a lot of these being bought as gifts in a shower. Mm -hmm. So family members, grandparents, that I mean, they may be a big customer for this that actually ends up being your at least initially, maybe your, your highest purchasing product, right? Yeah, for sure. Great. Okay, so, do you know everything there is to know about every one of these? Not even close. <laughs> so, some of these were not on your original list, so right. like, this one was not, this one you might have thought of, but you didn't put it on your initial list. Thank you, doctors. Um, you thought of this one, family, you just didn't list it. Right? This one's properly new to me. I never really considered Pro properly it. Properly new? Okay. Yeah. Well, this is, this is Dave's business. Yeah. So you should talk to Dave about that. Yeah. Right? Um, especially retailers. So, uh, how, many, how many of these are there? Four million in the U.S. per year. That's now, are there any qualifying factors or is it just everybody? That, I mean, that's just everybody who's in the first time pregnancy, right? Yeah. So are there any qualifying criteria that make uh, uh, a person more attracted to something like this? Not really. If they're, if they're too, so yeah, if there's an age range, um, the oldest of our moms in their 40s are not super into this like a generational difference in the use of technology. Um, income doesn't seem to matter uh, because everyone has somebody who has purchased something off their registry that costs and set our price point. Um, because like, I'm not paying as long as somebody in my family or somebody. Not I everybody know. has somebody that has that disposable income. That's true. Really. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a segment that doesn't yeah. have a person like that. Yeah. But uh, in, yeah, so that's a good point. So, th so there are some, I'm going to put it in yeah. red here, there's other qualifying criteria here to think about. Yeah. These are all risk, risk points. Um, uh, what does, let's jump to value for a minute, just because, for a time perspective, what's the family member's value? What do they get out of it? Um, to express that they love this kid so much and that they're so supportive and that they're doing well in life. <laughs> so, is there any way you can quantify it? It's a good question. Is there a good way I can quantify that? Maybe using mm -hmm. like 
alternative solutions, like if not buying your stuff, like what else they, they would buy? Like use the price tag of other product that potentially it can substitute or like in right. place of your product. So what are the substitute products? Let's think about that for a minute. What are the substitute products for this? Um, so right now, a lot of the substitutes are actually behaviors. Um, like, I want to feel connected to my kid, I want to feel like a good mom, I can either not go out, I can go out and feel bad, or I can go out and call and text the babysitter all day. Um, but as far as products, there's like an independent GPS monitor that people can put on their kids that's um, doing quite well called GeoBit. Um, and then there are like overnight physiological monitors, like Owlet, which is like a smart sock, um, and there are things like the Nanit and the Miku, which are computer vision cameras that you put over your child and they overnight measure breathing and stuff. Okay, so there's, so there's video monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also just paying someone to watch the person, the, the child. Not in the same... The other extreme. Not in the same category of experience. Like, they... Dads always... So dads... Like, we actually started talking about this as a parent product, not a mom or a dad product. Um, but we find that dads and moms talk about it, view it, and categorize it very differently. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, dads think about it like that. Oh, well, there's somebody watching the kid. But moms think about that as a totally different activity. These are complementary. By the way, yeah. we didn't even list dad as a customer. <laughs> He's not even on here. It's because he wants to pay of, half of what I'm it costs. I'm personally offended by it. It's because <laughs> you want to pay <laughs> half of what it costs. <laughs> uh, so dads are, not, dads are not a customer? I mean, yeah, there are going to be some. Yeah, I mean, if they're not, they're not. I, I think dads would probably pay in the right segment. They'd probably pay a lot for. I haven't met them, but I would be happy to be introduced to them. If you know any, <laughs> send them my way. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. I mean, yeah, look what happened with the donuts. <laughs> uh, how many? Well, I didn't, I didn't know whether I was going to. I just got tricked into that one. All right, working moms. How many working moms are? There? I forget off the I can not not pulling the number right now. So my point in doing this yeah. exercise is to demonstrate there's a lot of detail here, right? I mean we just went through I don't know how many different customers we have here. You may decide to eliminate a customer, but eliminate it for a reason. Don't eliminate because you didn't think of it. Yeah. Right? Go through every customer and make a decision, are they relevant or not? And you have to have a, a good reason for doing so. And then you need to define the criteria for each of those customers. So, you know, income is probably one you ought to think about, right? Dads, maybe. Working moms, how many of them are there? Um, you know, there's another one we didn't even list, which is potentially um, healthcare payers, right? If there's a, because that's a good way to start putting the money to what's the cost of a hospital trip or, you know, those sort of things, right? So you, you have to quantify this as much as possible, yeah. In, in this discussion, uh, in particular on dads, where, where does it fall into create customers? Because the way dads think now, they might not be customers. But so, it could be conceivable to educate them in a different way that would make them customers. And there's absolutely a way to, yes. And there's absolutely a way to sell this to dads. Um, it's just that for our MVP, it, and like we think about like our product as we want it to be, mm -hmm. and that'll be appealing to dads, actually. But the product that we can get out the door first um, does two things: location and a qualitative. Yes, there isn't a live human attached to that. That's what moms want. Dads want really high fidelity data and what features. Um, and when we can do that, then dad's going to be driving, like driving the interest on our product, right? But yeah, so that's, that's kind of how we did that. Let, let me generalize an answer though a little bit to your question because I think it's an important one. And I, it's not unusual that I get this question. So usually the way it's worded is, um, aren't there times <coughs> where you create a product that's so innovative that nobody asked for it, right? And isn't that real innovation, <coughs> right? So think about what Steve Jobs did with Apple, right? Frankly, think about what that guy right there on that column did when he developed a treatment, this is one of my dear friends, the founder of Respironics, was the guy who developed the treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. Any, people didn't even know obstructive sleep apnea was a disease back then, right? And the answer to that is that 
you get that kind of innovation by focusing on the problem, right? You focus on identifying and understanding very deeply the customer and the problem, and then real innovation comes where you marry a deep knowledge of a customer's problem with a new technology that you, as the inventor, see, see the opportunity for that, for that cross, right? That's where innovation occurs. I mean, that's the iPod. There were MP3 players out before Apple came out with the iPod. That wasn't a new idea. What Steve did was figure out that if he did it a completely different way, he could actually create a market that up until that point was a crappy market. Right? So it's understanding the problem, that's where you get the answers to that kind of thing. All right, well, I think, are we over? Yeah. Um, my, my whole point in doing this, thank you. This is a cool product, we should talk about it more. Thanks, um, Is I just wanted to do that with somebody so that you kind of get a feel for, you have to spend a lot of time going really deep here. And you're better to start with more detail and then say, I'm gonna do an MVP on first time moms because that's where I think my opportunity is the best. That's perfectly fine, right? As long as you've thought about why that's the, the, the point you wanna start with and why you may not even worry about pet owners because it's not, not a market that you wanna go after right now. Right? I'd rather you do that because you did it for a reason rather than you never took the time to dive deep. And then you have to have a value for every one of those. Any questions on this? Someone please come eat some donuts. Yeah. I think we're done. <laughs>